Well, praise the Lord. Once again, we welcome you to this time of worship and praise hosted by the Faith, Hope and Love Center. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And of course, we would be having a time of worship and praise. We would have a time of going before God in intercession because God is a prayer answer in God. And then we'd want to get into the word of God. And today's topic we are looking at, my search is over. We'd be right back as we welcome our worship team. We'd come back and share the ministry of the word.
Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you today as we pray healing over the nations of this world. The nations have been crippled by this COVID-19 pandemic. Lives have been lost, Father. Economies are in turmoil. We pray that a vaccine will be available soon to rid the world of this dreaded virus. We pray for Trinidad and Tobago, Father. We pray for the sick and those in suffering as a result of COVID. We pray for those who have lost their jobs, dear Father. We pray that our economy will turn around and our young people can once more be able to gain employment and provide for their families. We pray that the crime situation in our beloved country will change for the better. Citizens will feel comfortable, feel safe to walk the streets, go to public spaces with their loved ones without fear. Pray that there won't be any violence during this election campaigning that is taking place across the country. Father. Pray for citizens to instead unite and demonstrate good camaraderie. As we face elections on August 10th, 
with a calm and responsible behavior by all those going out of food. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome back. We thank God for the opportunity to be at His throne in worship and praise. We thank God for the opportunity to approach Him with confidence in our time of prayer. We now want to examine the Word of God, and today we would be drilling down from the book of Ecclesiastes as we explore this topic, My search is over. My search is over. And I'm reading Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and verse 10, which reads, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all of my labor, and this was my portion of all my labor. My search is over. Some time ago, Jeffrey Kaufman wrote a very important book entitled Loss of the Assumptive World. Loss of the Assumptive World. And what Kaufman sought to examine in this book is a theory of traumatic loss. You see, if as a human being you have ever experienced trauma, you would discover the things that we hold as definite, the things that define our reality, seem to disappear and dissipate because of that trauma. What we hold as dear and real seem to be no more. I want to suggest our search, and my search is over, is springing from that reality of the loss of our assumptive world. You see, my friend, when you lose a sense of what's supposed to be real, it may spring from an experience of trauma and natural disasters. Oh yes, all along we've been doing fine. Then here comes a trauma. Here comes a natural disaster that seemed to rip from under our feet a sense of certainty. If you have ever experienced a death of a close friend or a close family member, you would begin to experience this loss of the assumptive world. All that we assume, you see, sometimes we assume, oh, if I do A, B, and C, then everything will fit into place. Death and tragedy striking the family causes a loss of your assumptive world. Then, you know, if you've experienced that sense of tiredness with life, life seems to be a routine. I get up, I go to work, I go to school, I go to church, I stay home, I am with my family, I eat, I drink. And then there's this deep void and emptiness. What is life all about? And you could experience levels of exhaustion, and the sense of the possibility of a fulfillment. And life seemed to be a dead-end road because I've lost the sense of what is real and what is true. You see, the most important question you can ask yourself is, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? We go past all of the niceties of life. We go past all of the necessities of life. We go past all of the things that we claim that will give us deep-seated happiness. And I tell you, when trauma, death, exhaustion with life seem to, like a current, eat at the heart of your soul, you need to ask yourself the question, what is the meaning of life? Then, which leads us actually to, what is the most important task? You know, Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl 
made a profound statement uh, as, as he spoke to the whole matter of the meaning to life. Frankel says, life is not primarily a quest for pleasure or a quest for power, but a quest for meaning. The greatest task for any person is to find meaning in his or her life. And Viktor Frankl, oh, he is qualified, overly qualified to speak to this question about meaning, having been a Holocaust survivor. The most important admission then is having gone full circle, we need to ask ourselves, am I still alive or am I dead? Have I actually found meaning in life? These are important admissions that we must, in fact, come to terms with. Oh, I may sound a bit philosophical today, but, but the reality is we are all are on a search. A search for meaning, a search for significance, a search for purpose. You know, one of the most frustrating things you could experience is when you ask a question about the meaning to life, hoping that some wise sage or prophet would be able to give you the answer. You know, I saw this, this cartoon drawing some time ago that made me chuckle. Here it is. This gentleman is asking this old sage or wise man, what is the meaning of life? And the wise man said, I, I don't know. The computers are down. Oh, yes. Everybody's Googling today, looking and searching for answers and looking for searching for meaning. You see, the most important source for your answer uh, to, to this question, I want to suggest really, is the Bible, the eternal word of Almighty God. And particularly the book of Ecclesiastes, because the writer to the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, that king of Israel, he went on a mad search to answer this question question, what is the meaning to life? So I want to first of all talk about the human plight. Human beings, we are in a dilemma. And that is, Solomon begins his conversation that life is meaningless. The plight is of this. He says, when he searched life, in Ecclesiastes 1.3, he says, nothing to gain from all his labor. Ecclesiastes 1.3 again, he says, you know, people come and people go. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 5 to 7, he says, nature is like a meaningless cycle. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, there's no closure to knowing. We're ever knowing. There's always a new edition. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. He says, novelty is an illusion. There's nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 11. He says, human memory could be unkind. What a plight man finds himself. But then the second thing we need to examine is the human pursuit. You see, there's the human plight where you have discovered Having surveyed life, that labor is nothing. People come, people go. Nature is like a meaningless cycle. There's no closure to knowing. Novelty seems to be an illusion, and the human memory could be so unkind. And so what Solomon decided to do is to go on a pursuit. This human pursuit really is a pursuit of self-indulgence. The text that we read when we started our discourse says, he says, nothing I would held for my desire and loss. I will seek for meaning. I will seek for purpose. My eyes and my heart desired meaning and purpose. And so when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, chapters 1 and 2, here's what Solomon did. He said, I I sought for meaning in laughter. I sought for meaning in wine. I sought for meaning in wisdom. I sought for meaning in folly. I sought for meaning in great works, houses, vineyards, trees with all kinds of fruit. I sought for meaning in gardens and orchards. I sought for meaning in building fancy pools of water. 
I sought for meaning by having an array of serpents and maids right at my footstep. I sought for meaning in great possessions of cattle. I sought for meaning in silver and gold and peculiar treasures. I sought for meaning in singers and instruments and dancing. I sought for meaning. You know, I hear some people say, if I was only rich enough, I will be fulfilled and I will find meaning to life and my search would be over. If I only win the lotto, then it will fulfill all the deepest needs of my heart. If I only live in such and such a place, or I own in such and such, I will be and I will be. I'll tell you this. Solomon tried it already. He was the richest. And the wisest man on earth. Yet he sought for meaning because there was this vacuum in his soul. He said, I tried it in laughter. I tried it in wine and wisdom and folly and great works and gardens and pools and silver and great possession and singers and instruments. I'm constantly searching for meaning. At the end of the day, Solomon in Ecclesiastes 1-2 says, you know what? Life is meaningless meaningless or vanity of vanity, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What does man gain from all his labor and which he labors under the sun? And so this conclusion of self-indulgent is so self-evident. So in 2.11, he says, Then I look on all the work that my hands had wrought, and all the labor that I'd labored to do, and behold, all was meaningless and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. You see, my friend, when you are searching for significance and meaning, think of Solomon. He is at the top of the food chain, he was the wisest and the richest. And he says, nothing he imagined in his heart and his mind he kept from him and so from himself. And so he sought for significance and meaning. What are you searching for? What are you seeking for? What do you want to fill that deep vacuum in your soul? Oh, if you bring out the thoughts of your soul, Solomon would say to you, been there, done that. And I have the answer to show it. When you reach where you are going, you realize you haven't started the journey yet. We'll be right back as we continue to talk about My Search is Over. Welcome back. We are talking about my search is over. And we have seen the human plight. That as you observe, observe and survey life, everything seemed to be ending at one terminal point, And that is meaninglessness, futility, vanity. Solomon, who was in a very advantageous position, used all his wisdom and all his resources, being the wisest and the richest man on the earth, to find meaning to life. And he says, I've searched in all kinds of ways and means, and ultimately my own soul discovered emptiness. But you know, there is an interesting human paradox. The human paradox is this. 
all of the things that Solomon pursued, ironically, we assume they are the terminal points for meaningfulness, happiness, and fulfillment. What a paradox. But yet we keep pursuing these things anyhow. Let me give you some of the examples uh, and pathways of this paradox and ironic journey. Solomon says, I pursued meaningless in knowledge. In chapter 1 and verse 18, he says, but you know what? Knowledge increases more sorrow and you can never know it all in chapter 8 and verse 17. He says, I tried it in mirth and laughter. But in chapter 2, 1 and 2 of Ecclesiastes, he says, mirth and laughter is vanity. He says, I tried, you know, meaningfulness in wealth. But then he says in 5, 10 and 6, 7, wealth never satisfies. And then in 5, 11, as your expenditure increases, so does your wealth. As your wealth increases, so does your expenditure. And more than that, as your expenditure and wealth increases in chapter 5 and verse 12, it prevents you from being for enjoying a good night's sleep. In chapter 5 and verse 13, he says, there's a loss through unfortunate means when you gather wealth. Chapter 5 and verse 15, life on earth ultimately ends in death and you leave all your wealth. In 5 verses 16 to 17, you don't always enjoy your wealth. So Solomon says, what a paradox. When I look around me, he says, human justice in itself creates an uneven playing field. There's wickedness instead of justice in chapter 3 and verse 6. Power seems to be on the, on the side of the oppressors in chapter 4, 1 to 3. Then, oh, there are so many cases where justice is delayed and evil is encouraged. Chapter 8 and verse 11. And then the righteous, they always, always get overpowered by the wicked. And the wicked seem to get what the righteous deserve. Then he says the poor and the, significant, the insignificant, they are forgotten. What kind of world do we live in? Look at the paradox of wisdom. You are the wisest man on earth. But in chapter 2 verses 14 to 17 says, Both the fool and the wise die and are forgotten. What about your work? From sundown, sunset to sun, you're working, 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 working. For what? He says that too is meaningless. Because why? After you work hard and build your edifices and build your kingdom, you die and it's left for somebody else to enjoy in chapter 2 and verse 18. And who knows, he says in 2.4, a fool might inherit it, not even appreciating your hard work. It's left for someone who did not even work for it. And the more you increase, the more it creates competition and envy in chapter 4 and verse 4. What a paradox. What about friendlinessness? Friendlinessness. Oh, I want friends. But there are people who have pulled their lives in such a way that they disconnect from friends. And he says, hey, if you're disconnecting from people, there's no one to share your rewards with in chapter 4 and verse 8 and verse 19. There's no one to support you in times of need, chapter 4 and verse 10. There's no warmth in times of cold, 4 and verse 11. And there was no one to protect you in times of danger. So many rich and famous die lonely deaths. What about leadership? What a paradox. You push hard to become the leader. But after a while, your popularity will wane because Solomon says in chapter 4 and verse 13, the old stubborn leader makes any change desirable. And so the new leader who, who soon comes, he's appreciated. But human allegiance is so fickle. Ah, the new leader rides a wave of popularity. But in chapter 14 and verse 15, very soon, that new leader would be forgotten. And then there's a matter of God's justice. He gives wealth, honor, and years. And does not allow people to enjoy it, says Solomon. This is a man searching for significance and searching for meaning. But oh, I want to suggest that there's a divine perspective. A divine perspective in terms of finding meaning. May I suggest these as you go through the book of Ecclesiastes. 
If you're going to have a practical approach to life and life meaninglessness, so you can say, my search is over. Some things you have to accept, they will not change. Chapter 1 and verse 15. We have to accept, too, that life is filled with recyclables. Just a few hours ago, I was chatting with my wife and we were talking about the amount of ties that I have. The fat ones, the thin ones. And I was saying to her, oh yes, the big fat ones like bibs, they are coming back. Life is about recyclables. The third thing you must understand that life is a gift from God. And because we understand life is a gift from God, it must be enjoyed to the max. Chapter 2, verse 24 and 26. Chapter 3, verses 12 to 13. Here's the fourth thing. If God is going to help you appreciate that your search is over, life is about seasons. Don't hold on to anything or anybody too tight. For every season, you must enjoy according to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. There is a time to die, a time to die, a time to live, a time to laugh, a time to cry. Here's the fifth thing. God will eventually judge the wicked in chapter 8, verses 12 to 13. Oh, number six, you should avoid laziness, but don't overwork or chase the wind. We must enjoy the labor, but don't chase the wind. Number seven, we must settle in our hearts and our mind that humans are fickle. Don't put your trust in them in chapter 4 and verse 16. Number eight, don't try to impress God with big promises that you cannot keep. Chapter 5, 1 to 7, it makes it abundantly clear. Number nine, not everything we see we should go after. Chapter 6, verses 7 to 9, not everything you see you must go after. Number 10, don't be naive about corruption. Why? Because it goes deeper than the eyes could see. People who are naive, they'll be hurt over and over and over and over with life. Chapter 5 and verse 8. Chapter 7, verses 27 to 29. Here's 11. Ignore things people say about you because we must remember we are guilty of speaking ill about others also. Chapter 7, verses 20 to 22. Then number 12, it is safe to obey those who are in authority. Chapter 8, verses 2 to 8. Safe to obey those in authority. Number 13, avoid acting as if you know it all. Because there's always a, 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 a new edition of something. So chapter 7, verses 23 to 24. And chapter 8, 16 to 7, it says, listen, slow down. We don't know it all. Number 14, make use of opportunities in life and avoid the petty excuses for making investments. God may bless your efforts anyhow. And then number 15, keep this in mind. Youth and vigor are fleeting. And so what we are called to do is to remember God in our youth according to chapter 11, verses 7 to chapter 12, verse 8. And then finally, Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for he will bring everything into judgment. Why is my search over? My search is over because Solomon already extended himself to explore meaning in so many things in life that we, who we are trying to find meaning, we are Johnny come lately. Solomon already discovered that life is meaningless. That life doesn't give fulfillment. Try laughter. Try wine. Try wisdom. Try folly. Try great works. Gardens. Orchards. Great pools. Servants. Maids. Great possessions of cattle. Silver. Gold. Peculiar treasures. Singers and instruments, and at the end of the day, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 1 2, vanity is vanity. All is vanity. There is no meaning to life. And if I could understand that's the conclusion of self indulgence, I could then begin to develop a divine perspective of life. So when I do my human pursuit, I will come up with the same conclusions that there's nothing to gain from our labor, 
People will come and go. Nature is a meaningless cycle. No closure to knowing. Novelty is an illusion. Human memory would be so unkind. And so when I develop this divine perspective, I step back and I look at this paradox and I say, yes, get all my knowledge, but there will always be an increase in knowledge. I can never know it all. Enjoy mirth and laughter. That in itself seems to be madness. Yes, get all your wealth, but you will never be satisfied and it will prevent you from having a good night's sleep. Oh yes, look to the human systems for justice, but wickedness exists instead of justice. Pursue wisdom with all your wisdom and all your certificates and all of your resumes and all of the fancy things that decorate your office wall. Here's what, both the fool and the wise will die and be forgotten. You want to work hard? Pursue work, enjoy your labor, but don't think that there'll be meaning necessarily in that ultimate sense would work. Why? Because you work hard and everything is left for another. Yeah, even a fool it could be left for. You want to exclude friends and people? Oh, I've been hurt so bad. I'm alone. I don't want people around. Then guess what? Here's what the Bible says. There'll be no one there to share your reward with. There'll be no one there to support you in times of need. There'll be no one there to bring you warmth and protect you from danger if you want to be friendless. You want to pursue leadership and drop all that you have. Ignore your family, ignore your health, so you become leader. Find ways and means to connive and vote a pad so you can become leader. Yes, yeah, here's what the Bible says. Humans are fickle in their allegiance. While you are seeking to push out the old stubborn leader, Ecclesiastes 4.15 says, Guess, you too will be pushed out by the generation who don't even know you. And then you may look to God and say, God, I need your justice to vindicate me for X, Y, and Z. And God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So yeah, as you pursue justice, you may say, God, you give wealth and honor and years and you don't allow people to enjoy it because I'm, on the, I'm in this mad search. So when I get a divine perspective, I begin to see life differently and I begin to accept that some things will not change. I begin to accept that life is like a fill with recycle, recyclables. I begin to accept that life is a gift from God and whatever time he gives me, I am going to enjoy it. Life is about season. I wouldn't hold on to anything too tight. Oh, God will judge the wicked. Maybe not in my time, but eventually he will. I will begin to understand that laziness doesn't profit. I could work, but I don't have to overwork and put my trust in riches. When I begin to develop a, a divine perspective, I realize that humans are fickle, so I would not put my trust in them. When I begin to develop a divine perspective, you don't try to impress God with big promises when you come into his presence. When you develop a divine perspective, not everything you see you should go after. When you develop a divine perspective, you would not be naive about corruption because there are levels of corruption existing in the world. When you develop a divine perspective, you will have to ignore things people say about you because you recognize our own frailty. When you develop a divine perspective, you realize it's better to obey the authorities because a divine perspective will also help you act and function in such a way that I don't know it all. When you develop a divine perspective, you use every opportunity in life and you don't make excuses, petty excuses why you would not accomplish things. I have seen then, I have found a terminal point for my search because in youth and in vigor, I realize God wants us to remember him now because ultimately, fear God, keep his commandments because this is the whole duty of human beings. And when you find yourself nestled in God, you will discover Things are around to be used for your benefit. But what shall it profit a man if he gains the entire world and suffer the loss of his soul? Your search could be over when you find God who promises to give you life and life more abundantly. So I thank you for our blessings. I thank you for what you have provided, but I will not put my trust 
in people and things because some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we'll remember the name of the Lord God of hosts. So Jesus turned to his disciples and said, Will you also go? And Peter responded in John chapter 6, Lord, whom shall we go to? Where can we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. Your soul then is satisfied because he gives you a bread, the bread that came from heaven. And if you drink of him and eat of him, you shall never, never thirst again or search again. You will then say, come see a man who told me all the things ever I did. Isn't he the Christ? God richly bless you. My search is over. Kelly on the beat, boy. Oh,